You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. And now, here is Fraser Hines. Welcome back to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, the podcast that explores the world of Doctor Who collecting and all kinds of Doctor Who related merchandise and sometimes just about Doctor Who in general. I am Larry Van Mersbergen, your host, and I've been a Doctor Who collector now for 41 years. I have been told I have one of the largest collections in the United States. I'm not sure if that's true, but I'll take it. I opened the first Doctor Who store in Chicago that exclusively served Doctor Who fans. In other words, I didn't open a comic book store that had Doctor Who. I opened a Doctor Who shop. And we had other things, too. We had James Bond novels. We had Avengers. uh, We had some Star Trek items. um, But mostly 90% of the business was Doctor Who. Uh, I called it Bundles from Britain. So if that rings a bell in your memory, if you were around back then and you ordered from us, thank you so much. Um, That company no longer exists, but it lives on in our memories. And one particular good way to figure that out is a book called Red, White, and Who, the story of Doctor Who in America. It's a wonderful book. I had no idea it was being written and no idea that my information was included. But Bundles from Britain lives on page 384. And you can find a convenient link to buy this book on the front page of our website at DoctorWhoCollectors.com. I just want every collector to have a copy. We are part of the Direction Point Doctor Who podcast network, and you can find us there at directionpoint.org. If you happen to be a Doctor Who podcaster, join today and you can join the ranks of this podcast along with Time Streams, Police Box in a Junkyard, the Doctor Who Target Book Club, and Traveling the Vortex. For more information and to join for free, go to directionpoint.org. And speaking of links, of course, I include this in every episode. Two great resources for all Doctor Who collectors include Timelash.com and the subcategory TARDIS Library. If you just go to Timelash.com, select the TARDIS Library, you could set up a free account to keep track of your collection, your print media, your visual media, your final records, your cassette tapes, um, and without cost. It's all free. You can also set up want lists. You can also set, you know, I don't have this, but I want it. You can set up um, all kinds of things there to kind of help you gather your collections. Unfortunately, it does not include uh, Doctor Who figurines or anything outside of the print media or visual or audio media. But that's uh, it's a great way to do it. I have most of my collection catalog there as well. Special thanks to our friend Dan O'Malley, who keeps that site up and running. Uh, If you need to do some research about something or to find out if something actually was made or existed, um, not long ago someone sent me an email asking if they had done a TARDIS uh, tin bank uh, with Colin Baker on it, and I can say for sure that they did not, even though somebody said they thought they saw one. Well, you were seeing things. Only Tom Baker and Peter Davison appeared on the tin coin banks, but you can find out for sure at Howe's Transcendental Toy Box... And you can visit that website at drwhotoybox.co.uk. And that, of course, is run by our good friend David J. Howe. So if you're looking, of course, for Doctor Who items at great prices, then you need to look no further than DoctorWhoStore.com. It's in the name. Uh, Alien Entertainment is the uh, business behind that, and they have exactly what you need, including things that they've recently picked up. Uh, The owner of that company just bought four Doctor Who collections, so a lot of things are coming up on the website daily. Uh, If you happen to live in the Chicago area, you can select free pickup from the store. They're open Wednesday through Saturday. And save on shipping. Um, And while you're there, browse the incredible selection of Doctor Who and other science fiction items. Uh, For store hours, visit alienentertainment.com. You can also find more great Doctor Who items at Forbidden Planet, one of our sponsors. And we're going to make this extremely easy. 
Just go to our website at DoctorWhoCollectors.com and select merchandise links. And we have links directly to Forbidden Planet. And we take a small, uh, we get a small percentage of the sale uh, that helps keep us on the virtual air. While you don't pay additional prices at all, you definitely get uh, a great item, the same price, but they share some of that money with us. So it's a great way to shop, get your Doctor Who items, and support this podcast all in one click. Uh, don't forget, of course, our own eBay store. We maintain an eBay store. Uh, lots of Target books and some hardcovers and uh, other various items there. Those sales for those items also help keep the podcast going. Right now, our bills are paid thanks to those efforts. So all the benefits, of course, proceed the podcast. The podcast is a nonprofit, so we have to raise our money. In addition, of course, to all the podcasts and those merchandise links on our website, we have one of the most complete guide to Doctor Who classic hardcover books ever published. Uh, We list a lot of reprints that other people didn't even know existed, and some that uh, we're still continuing to track down. Lots of new sources have come into play here, including one we're going to talk about on today's show that we're still vetting, and we're going to make sure that we get as much information out there that we can. We are now counting down to Chicago TARDIS 2022. If you happen to visit that wonderful convention here in the Midwest that's in beautiful Lombard, Illinois at the Westin Hotel, I will be there all three days. Uh, Usually I present Doctor Who Collecting in some form. I'm hoping that it'll be a Doctor Who Collector's Showcase. Uh, I have, um, you know, we're trying to work with uh, Chicago TARDIS. Uh, We floated the idea of a museum room so that you can come and see some of this stuff up close and get a a, a hands-on tutorial um, of of some of these items or see things you, you probably won't see in a dealer's room or a store or a website. So there we go. Uh, guests that we have so far, there haven't been a lot of updates in the last couple months, but we are getting close, so those are about to change. But anyway, we have Sylvester McCoy, the seventh doctor. Uh, you also might know him from uh, the Hobbit movies, uh, the you know, Radagast the Brown, that was him. Uh, we have Fraser Hines, uh, who played Jamie McCrimmon, of course, in the series. He comes with your ticket at every convention, I think. Jason Haig Ellery, the CEO of Big Finish. You can ask him here questions about Big Finish right up close and in person. He's a great guy, very approachable. And we have Sophie Aldred, who played Ace not only in the original series with Sylvester McCoy, and I'm probably guessing there'll be a photo opportunity with the Seventh Doctor and Ace. You can't miss that. Uh, She's also reprising Ace in the anniversary episode that is set to come out very soon. So keep uh, ChicagoTardis.com in your uh, bookmarks and experience the best Doctor Who convention in the Midwest. And, of course, they honor me with the title of Doctor Who official official Doctor Who collecting expert. And uh, that's why I I usually present those things. I also present panels and other topics as well. I've been a speaker uh, for a couple of years. Um, If you want to check out my Doctor Who collecting uh, discussion from the 2020 uh, Chicago TARDIS, which was all virtual, uh, just go to the Chicago TARDIS YouTube or Facebook page streams. You could also visit our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and search the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. Uh, When you get to our channel, select playlists, and my collecting panel will be under that. More updates to Chicago TARDIS as they happen. A uh, special thank you to our sponsors that include Forbidden Planet and Bags Unlimited Incorporated. So most of your collection protection materials you can get at bagsunlimited.com. And one more link I like to throw out there because, you know, friends uh, are, are important to support out there. Uh, in addition, uh, we've got Telos Publications. That's telos.co.uk. Lots of great stuff from David J. Howe. And uh, yes, they do ship to the United States at reasonable prices. Uh, As far as what's going on with me, well, uh, we are now currently in mid-September, and we're coming up on an appearance here at, I'm presenting Doctor Who Collectability at Doctoberfest, I love that name, and that's going to be in Indianapolis, Indiana on Saturday, October 22nd, so if you Google Doctoberfest 2022, you will come up with a link to a forum, it'll take you to a link to what's going on there. That's going to be at the Holiday Inn in Camby, Indiana, and also also at the store Who North America. And of course, uh, next uh, November, we've got Chicago TARDIS 2022 at the Lombard. And with any hope, uh, I will be returning to Consinity, the Gathering of the Geeks in Milwaukee in 2023. 
So keep an eye on, uh, I'm going to try to get a calendar of events on the website coming soon so you can uh, see me at these various events. Uh, if you do see me at an event, please come up and say hello. Tell me you're a listener. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss Doctor Who collecting with you anytime. Uh, what's new to the collection? Okay, recently uh, received here a wonderful copy of the Time Warrior hardcover. Now I can add that to our 78 section. Um, I have a Doctor Who Trump card game from 1978 that's in really excellent condition. And, of course, from Big Finish, I just received Beyond War Games, Stories of the Second Doctor on CD. I love talking to collectors, and our, new, our motto is uh, let's talk about your collection. And absolutely. I mean, we're not trying to intervene here. We want to encourage you and we want to help you. We want to give you resources. We want to give you tips and tricks and how to defeat some of these uh, price gouging episodes that we've uh, we've done here, um, especially trying to figure out what is the best price. That's why we do a segment called The Most Outrageous Offer. We try to make sure we, you're educated not to spend your hard-earned money where you could actually get more for your money. Um of course, if you'd like to share your story here, we'd love to turn the microphone over to you. You can contact me at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast at gmail.com. On today's show, we continue our coverage of classic Doctor Who hardcovers, the next episode in that series, with our special guest, Tony Witt, the host of the Doctor Who Target Book Club, who will tell us exactly how those stories rated if you were to read the book. Um, this time we're in 1979, uh, books with dust jackets except for one. So if you want to see the video, you got to see us on Patreon. And um, what you'd like to do there is go to uh, patreon.com backsplash Doctor Who backsplash black slash. That's how you know this is live. Uh, Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Patreon.com backslash Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. That's uh, one good way to support us, uh, especially if you want to see our um, our video today with uh, Tony Witt. Tony never appears on video, but that's okay. We're here to see the books. So that's what's important there. So $15 and above, and you can watch all the videos from our podcast, including our interview with Sadie Miller, our interview with Lauren Cornelius, our talks with Katie Haynes, and anything you would like to see there. Even if you want to subscribe for one month, watch all the videos and quit. No problem. The $15 helps us stay on the air. Um, if you want to support us in a different location, uh, we are on Podbean. And so you can go to doctorcollectors.podbean.com and become a patron there and support us at any level you choose. And speaking of money, I know this is always a, a, a sore subject during inflation times, but we are currently raising money to bring Doctor Who legend Peter Purvis. And if you don't know who he is, he played Stephen Taylor and traveled with the first Doctor. Uh, Peter Purvis is 83 years old, and um, we would like to support him because uh, at this point in time, his income stream is limited to presentations, appearances, and all that stuff, and so we want to help him as best we can. Our goal here is $271, which is exactly what the agent is asking us to pay. We're not asking for a penny more. If we get any more, we're going to give it to Stephen as an honorarium, if they'll accept it. Uh, your sponsorship of this podcast will reach a lot of listeners and would be my highest ranking guest. So you just go to DrWhoCollectors.com, click on the Donate button, and make sure you enter the words Peter Purvis in the message, and we'll add you to that sponsor list. Um, I will let you know if we if we do reach our, our goal and we reach a little bit above, we will cut off donations at that point. But anything received above and beyond, we will be giving to Mr. Purvis. So we hope you'll step up and help us out. Our theme song is Who's Doctor Who, composed by the great Barry Mason and Les Reed, performed, of course, by Fraser Hines. In addition to Fraser on the track, you may know that Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin plays the guitar. I didn't know that till just recently, but what an amazing guitar solo it is on that track. Uh, Mason and Reed, of course, wrote great songs, including Love Grows As My Rosemary Goes, It's Not Unusual, and a song called Everybody Knows. Frazier said they had the best songwriters, the best musicians, but the song never became that popular. Except now, it's our theme song on the podcast. Um, you can hear this podcast, of course, anywhere you get your podcasts. If you're stuck on one place and you don't like it, you can get it from Amazon Music. You can hear us on YouTube, Audible, Podchaser, Podtail, and Podbean, and almost anywhere you get your podcast. There's just a few places that don't carry us, but that's okay. Uh, we are also a Direction Point Network podcast. You can find us at directionpoint.org, and you can find all the other podcasts in that network as well. 
So there we go. Um, after a quick break here, we, of course, we will have our, uh, coll- our brief collection protection segment. Our main story on Target hardcovers of 1970, or I should say uh, WH Allen slash Target based uh, target book-based hardbacks. They're not target hardbacks. Don't get me wrong there. Um, we will have our main story, of course, and, of course, the most outrageous offer, which gives you three items from the same store. All three emails came from three different people who wanted to remain anonymous, but they all came from the same place. So that already raises my eyebrows. So stay tuned. Are you ready to travel through time with us? Then check out Traveling the Vortex, a Doctor Who podcast. For nearly seven years and more than 500 episodes, we've traveled from one end of the vortex to the other, making different stops with different doctors, reviewing everything from TV stories to audio plays, from books to comics, and more. Sean, Keith, and Glenn take you on a journey through 50-plus years of Doctor Who episodes and spinoff materials. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, so be sure to check us out. And now, we're a proud member of Direction Point, a Doctor Who podcast network. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Hi, I'm Juliet. And I'm Nathan. Experience Doctor Who from the very beginning through a classic fan's eyes. And through the eyes of a new Who fan. Reminisce and relive those classic moments with Nathan as he offers fun insight. Or experience them for the first time with Juliet as she dwells on social issues, history, fashion, and the size of a flashlight. We're the Time Streams Podcast. Find us on Spotify, Stitcher, or Apple Podcasts. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Sad, Red, isn't it? People spend all that time making nice things, and other people come along and break them. And now it's time for collection protection. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, hardcover protection, another possible uh, solution there. Um, one of the things I noticed as collecting Doctor Who hardcovers is some of the ex-library copies that I've seen are covered in a plastic cover that the library put on when they bought the book. And some of these books go back to the 70s. Well, I carefully removed that book so I can maintain the integrity of the book in my collection. And now I'm double thinking that because the dust jacket is in perfect condition. As, as long as they don't tape it to the book or use scotch tape or anything like that, usually they, if they use library tape, it comes right off without leaving a mark. But um, some libraries do that, some don't. But in a lot of cases, you don't need any tape at all. You just put the case on. So I thought about this, and I thought, well, maybe it's time to put them all back into into jacket covers and protect them even further. Um, But this is a a wonderful idea. So Jacket Covers, there's another company here that makes those jacket covers in various sizes, and you can do them not just for your Doctor Who classic card covers, but for, like, your your Doctor Who The Celebration and other W.H. Allen books or other hard covers that are of different sizes, such as uh, The City of Death or Scratch Man or anything that's come out. So anyway, I'm talking about the website, The Library Store, all one word, Com. So it's the library store.com. And uh, we're looking at multi fit adjustable book jacket covers, durable, economical covers without paper liners. So these have no paper liners, they're just jacket covers. So your choices here um, on this is that you can either buy a roll or you can buy 50 sheets with anchor tabs or 50 sheets without anchor tabs. And that's going to vary the price anywhere from $12.85 to $62.89. So for, for argument here, I'm going to say a roll. And that means you basically, you know, you roll it and you tear it off where you need it. Um, they have three different thicknesses here. You can get one mil for light duty, 1.5 mil for normal duty, or two mil for heavy duty. I would probably select two mil. I want this to be uh, protected. And then you have the size and the cover length. So the book height, basically, you can go from eight inches to nine inches to 10 and a half to 12, all the way to 16 by 200. Uh, or a 300 foot roll, depending on the size. So let's say we get a nine inch, uh, let's see, I think an eight inch roll would fit our classics here. And uh, you're looking at a price of 56.95, which gives you 300 feet. And that'll cover most um, large collections of Doctor Who books. Or let's say I don't want to roll, I want to get 50 sheets with anchor tabs. Uh, and we do the same thing here uh, the heavy duty thickness, and we get the uh, 
eight inch book here by 17 um, half inch rate. It's about fifteen dollars and nine cents. So you can actually kind of measure your books and get the right thing. And these are actual uh, things that go right to book jacket covers. Uh, they have all kinds of library supplies, including uh, professional bookends and uh, protective covers, laminating film, shelf organizers, uh, library tape. All that great stuff. You know, it's kind of something that looks like it could be for either public or school libraries. But they, you know, our goal here is to protect our collection. So uh, check out the library dot com. Uh, they are not a sponsor. They did not pay for this advertising. I found them on my own and I found them very intriguing. So give them a shot. This has been Collection Protection. Up there is the scanner. Those are the doors. That is a chair with a panda on it. Sheer poetry, dear boy. And now it's time for our main story. This is a continuation of the coverage of the classic Doctor Who hardcovers that we have done for a few episodes now. We've covered 74 all the way through 78, covering the imprints of Universal Tandem, which at the time included Ellen Wingate and Longbow. Uh, we begin in 1979, where the W.H. Allen imprint is used exclusively, and you will see Longbow for one final time. That is the last one. It begins strong, uh, just like the previous year, um, but ends very weak. In fact, a very overall weak year, with a total of 10 hardcovers published, one reprint, eight new publications, and one American publication. Compared with the Target paperbacks, with only seven titles published, six reprints, and one children's book, they were definitely not keeping pace in 1979. So again, a brief history, and the reason I cover the brief history listeners is that you can begin these episodes in any order. There is no requirement to go back in time and listen to previous ones. You can listen at any point. So if you've already heard this, you can hit that fast forward button. Again, a brief history. In 75, Universal Tandem was sold to the British conglomerate Howard and Wyndham, and the company was renamed Tandem Publishing Limited before being merged with the paperback imprints of Howard and Wyndham's general publishing house, W.H. Allen, becoming Wyndham Publications Limited in 1976. And the next year, in 77, the Wyndham identity was completely phased out. So the tandem imprint will remain until 1980. The surviving titles from that backlist were reprinted under W.H. Allen's principal paperback imprint, which is called Starbucks. The Target imprint survives until 1993, though in the later years uh, it is exclusively used for Doctor Who novelizations, but not as much in the beginning. Alan Wingate imprint was forever retired at the end of 1977 without a lot of fanfare. So W.H. Allen was the new imprint used and was will be used for the Doctor Who run until the end of it in 1988. Of course, anytime I even invoke the words Doctor Who novelization or novel, um, I have a signed order by Irving Braxiatel in the collection to include our resident expert on Doctor Who novels, and that is the host and producer of the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, a Direction Point Network podcast, the incomparable Professor Tony Wett. Welcome back, my friend. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the warm welcome. I have to really kind of dispute the idea that I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> the definitely a so-called <laughs> expert, so we have to put well, that in, that qualifier. I, I, think, I think many people recognize you as such, and so I think in the academic world we call that equivalency by reputation. Okay, I'll take it. So for, for those who don't... Who, <laughs> For those who don't have doctorates, that's what they call it anyway. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm <laughs> so, no David J. Howell. I don't claim to be David J. Howell, but I'll, I'll I, take it. I, and I'll say that David J. Howe would never claim to be Tony Witt. No, because so, he doesn't know who I am. <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess that's fair enough. Yeah, I've, I've no, I know David very well. He's a, a wonderful guy. And uh, you actually sat next to him uh, at one of our podcasts uh, a few years ago. I, so. I sat next to his wife, so his, oh, wife, his wife knows right, who Samantha. I am. <laughs> yeah, so Samantha knows who you are. Uh, wonderful. Okay, so the, the publication, of course, of 10 Doctor Who books is actually six less than last year in 1978. And this consists, of course, of one American hardcover, which is an interesting uh, little deviation, which I'll explain later. Eight new books and the and what I thought was the last reprint, but it turns out not to be the last reprint. So hold on to your hats for that. So this was a significant reduction in publications. 
We're not sure exactly what was happening with the company in 79, but we know that the world was going through um, quite a bit of bad times during then. Uh, these hardcovers, of course, are extremely sought after today, and you might have to take out a student loan and have it forgiven in order to afford them. <laughs> so uh, we tie in some current events. That way you know this is being taped at the time it's being taped, everybody. Um, you can find these books in a couple of different ways. Number one is X Library Edition, which is very common, which is a book that's either been pulled, withdrawn from a library, or stolen from a library. Uh, you can also find, uh, with limited success, a retail store version publish a review copy, or what we all call a non-library edition. That seems to be the two terms that collectors are using. None of these titles were distributed in the United States, and neither were any Target books in the United States in 1979. So, speaking of 1979, any memories of that year, Tony, or is that a blur? Um, that is a blur. In fact, the only thing... Gosh, what do I remember from... Oh, right. 1979 was the year that I developed a crush on Gil Gerard because Buck Rogers in the 25th Century was airing. That's true, yes. Oh, gosh, I, I never missed an episode. And if you don't uh, mind me uh, plugging one of my other properties, mm -hmm. I've done an episode of my YouTube show, That 70s Review, about Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. So if anyone wants to hop over there and go to youtube.com forward slash Emperor Dalek... You can see my take on it there. But, yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was like, 1979, that's the only thing I remember from 1979. <laughs> well, uh, I'll share some of my one of my big memories from 79. But first, let me talk, tell everybody what was happening in the world of Doctor Who, especially here in the United States in 1979. Um, this was the second year of Tom Baker stories airing because of the big success it had in the previous year. And now showing across the United States and now for the first time in rural parts of Canada. Hmm. So, hey there, the doctor's on air, you know. Uh, in March, Pinnacle Books launches Day of the Daleks and the Doomsday Weapon promo and U.S. edited paperback books. And I, I didn't pick these up until 1981, but I went to the grocery store and these were sitting in a bin. It says here, free, take one. It's a little little tiny preview of the Doctor Who Pinnacle books. And there is uh, it's it's really cool. It's got, you know, from the America series, number one publisher, um, and a little the introduction by Harlan Ellison, which is in all the first editions of Pinnacles, and then a little excerpt from Doomsday Weapon. Day of the Daleks and Genesis of the Daleks, all uh, pinnacle editions, and a schedule for publication for the remaining editions in the back. And I remember this really well because uh, this was the same trip, and this was uh, fast forward to 81, um, when uh, my mother used to take me grocery shopping with her, and this was the time she said, hey, a comic shop opened up around the corner. Why don't you check it out while I do this? And I was like, Oh, yay, okay. And, uh, of course, they had a huge wall of Doctor Who items. I bought the monthly number 70. I bought uh, Day of the Daleks Target book, which was $4.81 in 1981. Mm. And I got those. I went back to the grocery store. I found my mom. We got to the checkout counter, and there were these. Mm. Uh, and, and these. Oh, wow. <laughs> so these are the books I actually bought in 1981. But these came out in 1979. So um, the Day of the Daleks and uh, the Doomsday Weapon, these are the first editions uh, of those books. And the uh, retail price on these, I believe, is $1.75. Mm -hmm. So these were cheaper. I could get two of these for the price of Day of the Daleks Target. And so, uh, of course, the Target books in 81 were being imported directly from England, so the cost was higher. But uh, I picked up two of these, and uh, I wanted to take the entire stack of these, but my mom said you could have two. So <laughs> I still have both of them. Um, in fact, I display them uh, one side. One of them's got the Day of the Dalek side and one's got the Doomsday Weapon side. So mm -hmm. I thought that is super cool. Uh, the um, the uh, Also, in addition, I recently uh, picked up from our good friend Dale Santos. This is the promotional poster for... The Pinnacle books, Ooh. and I don't remember seeing this on the on the uh, grocery store wall, but I guess several bookstores had it, and um, it was kind of a huge marketing push uh, in the late seventies, and it yes, it did very well because uh, these early edition Pinnacle books got up to eight reprints. Ooh. 
okay. which is pretty cool. Uh, also, uh, let's see, the, the Doctor Who Annual 1980 was published, featuring Tom Baker. Not available in the United States at that time, but it did come out at that particular moment. I need to find a place to put things here. Okay, next, uh, of course, uh, a final record in September of Genesis of the Daleks was done with linking narration by Tom Baker. It would be the first Doctor Who audio story ever created from an existing soundtrack. And this is the original record from 1979. Uh, oh, also the very first issue of Doctor Who Weekly was published, and that would be this one here nice. uh, by M Marvel UK, uh, including the free transfers. And I love the ad on the back for Mr. Bellamy. <laughs> so this was uh, pretty cool, his licorice novelties. And the advertising was it, it was pretty interesting because it was all non-Doctor Who because they just got started. Um, the And, you know, Tony, being an English uh, teacher, I, I know you, you probably worked on publications in your life at some point. At some point, yeah. So imagine trying to do a weekly publication. Mm. Um, the work alone just to try to, you know, have to have it get out every Friday. You yes. Yes. So, unfortunately, the weekly editions only lasted 42 issues before going to monthly. And I'm sure they just all went, thank you. Right. Because <laughs> that's way too much. But um, the weeklies were very popular. There was a, uh, I believe, a pinup in the middle here. If I can get to it here. I don't know if I can open it up. It never wants to do it live. But let's also be clear. It's a pinup of something like... One of the doctors or a Dalek, yeah. not Katie yes. Manning with a Dalek, because no. that would not be seen in Doctor Who Weekly. It would not. As lovely and, as she is. <laughs> and, and she's a she's a dear friend. She so is indeed. absolutely. But unfortunately, there's no pin up in the first edition. There is in the second one. But it is a, usually a picture or a poster of the Doctor, and that continues through the monthly tradition. Uh, you can find uh, copies of Weekly Number 1 fairly easily, no more than $20. With the transfers, you might have a hard time, but I've got this one is one I've had since 1981, so they've had those. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, this is uh, this month uh, in the Target world, the Dalek um, special book was published, mm. and the significant thing about this book, it's the very first time you have artwork from Andrew Skilleter. Ah, uh, yes. In, in 1979. So, uh, and of course, he's credited on the back. And this was one of the non-Target novels that was released that year. Uh, and, of course, W.H. Allen continues to publish um, Doctor Who books in uh, both hardcover and paperback. But um, as far as 1979, and I don't know if you remember this uh, at all, Tony, but we had a major event happen here in the Chicago area that actually I, re I remember it clearly because it was on. We were watching it on TV as it happened, and we just couldn't believe what we were seeing. But on July twelfth, uh, nineteen seventy nine, uh, as as many people out there who maybe lived through that era uh, know that disco music was the most pop, one of the popular oh. things happening in the late seventies. So. Um, in 1979, July, July 12th, uh, the Chicago White Sox were set to play a doubleheader against the Detroit Tigers. And the attendance at Comiskey Park was horrible. I mean, like 400 people would show up for a game. And th they were doing anything they could to pack the stadium because it was just losing money and nobody was interested. The White Sox were having a terrible year as they had for several years that, that during that time. And so um, a local radio DJ by the name of Steve Dahl decided that he pitched an idea for disco demolition night. <laughs> and so if you brought a disco record to the game, you got in for 98 cents. Yes. And so he basically did this promotion. It was very successful. It was the first time Comiskey Park was at capacity in a long time. So it, the stands were filled and um, people brought disco records and probably other records as well. There was rumors that other, you know, country music was brought and all this. Other. So anyway, Steve Dahl hired a guy uh, who he thought was a demolitions expert. Turns out the guy had no idea about demolitions at all. <laughs> and they put this gigantic crate in the middle of center field during the, in the middle of the doubleheader and they loaded it up with the records. And the guy apparently used two sticks of dynamite, <laughs> not, not quarter dynamite, but, Oh. The whole deal. And 
not only did it explode, it dug a gigantic crater in the middle of center field. And Steve Dahl's like, death to disco. And they lit it up. And of course, after that was over, he, he he came on the field in a, in an army fatigue jacket and all that. And he left, he he, he said, I'm done. I'm gone. (laughs) Well, as soon as that fire went out, fans rushed the field and it turned into a full blown riot. Yes. And I, I recall watching this on TV. My dad was going, I can't believe what I'm seeing. <laughs> and, um, and a couple of years ago, I, I taught a class called uh, History of Pop Music, and I showed the ESPN footage to my kids, and they had all had their jaws dropped under their masks. <laughs> but they had their jaws dropped, and they couldn't believe what they were seeing either. Uh, Harry Carey, who used to call those games, was on the, you know, saying, hey, folks, we got to get back to our seats. And the, the manager of the Tigers goes out and says, we can't play. There's a hole in center field. <laughs> The Chicago SWAT team comes in in the in the old blue and helmets and all that back in the seventies. They're all there with their clubs trying to get people. You know, there were there was all kind. They were ripping the bases up. They were doing all. It took it took four and a half hours to calm that down. Mm. And but here's the thing that really got it: thirty nine people were arrested and charged with disorderly conduct. But the very next day, radio stations across the country stopped playing disco music. Mm-hmm because they were afraid that something like that would happen in their town. So it effectively ended disco Mm -hmm. in July of 1979. It was over. And uh, the Bee Gees blame Steve Dahl for ending their career. As well they should. (laughs) And that was, that was the big thing that happened in 1979 right here in our fair city. It was just, uh, and I've, I've often questioned my history teachers. Do you teach the disco riots of 79? They go, I've never heard of that. I said, well, you're not from here, are you? Yeah. (laughs) um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Don't, go ahead. The, the odd thing about that is I only learned about that through uh, the NPR program, This American Life. Oh, yeah, yeah, with Ira Glass. Yep, yeah, because they did a story on it after I moved here. So right. I was listening to it as I was driving along and thinking, oh, my God, I have never heard of this. And sure enough, they played audio from the explosion and yeah. the subsequent riot. And, and the rioting. It's oh my terrifying. Gosh. It, it was, and it, and the and the whole thing was over. And of course, all the people they interviewed, all the the people in the Vec family who owned it, and said we had no idea that was going to be the thing. And of course, the demolitions guy, Steve, you know, the Steve Dahl thought this guy was on the level, and it turns out he just was a a hack. <laughs> and they they did. Luckily, nobody was hurt in the explosion. That was a good thing. But and no one was hurt in the riots necessarily. It was just a lot of you know destruction going on. And and of course the White Sox lost the first game and had to lose by forfeit the second game. So it turned out not to be a good night for the Chicago White Sox, but a horrible night for disco music in general. Yes. So that was that was 1979. So um, and uh, of course that's the th- kind of thing you learn here on the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, now we'll get to the books, because that's what you're tuning in for. Um, In 1979, all Doctor Who hardcovers in 79 will either be W.H. Allen or one book will get the Longbow treatment for the very last time. Longbow, of course, is the children's imprint, was used sporadically, mostly for reprints, but during 78 it was used for the first five books, and we don't know why it was never used again or what happened to it. It just was one of those things. Um, it'll be the last time used there. All of the books will be issued with removable dust jackets except for one. And we'll explain why in a, in, when we get to that book. Um, I'm also using for this podcast for the very first time a new source material that was brought to my attention. It's an online book called Based on the Popular Television Serial, edited by Paul McSmith. Uh, it co- covers the entire run of Doctor Who publications, including hardcover, paperbacks, print runs, notes about the publications and things that I had never seen before and haven't thoroughly vetted as of yet. Um, because in addition, uh, my other sources include Christopher Stone's unofficial guide to Doctor Who books and the Bundles from Britain catalog. And I will honestly say the only source I know to be 100 percent true is the catalog because, one, I wrote it. <laughs> and two, I had the books in my hand when we put that list together. Right. So I, I know for a fact those were the books that were included in that distribution. So unfortunately, the other two sources are 
our supposition. Uh, there's no footnotes. There's no actual data from WH Allen. In fact, uh, when I when I did speak to David J. Howe about the Target book, he said that's uh, a very murky water because a lot of those materials were gone, uh, especially the materials from the 70s. Uh, and so there was no real, you know, he covers a lot of information in the Target book that actually contradicts some of the things in this uh, in this Paul McSmith book. I'm still working on that. So before everybody jumps on me tomorrow on Facebook for saying that, um, I'm, you know, let me, let me put my research together and I will put that together. And, and speaking of which, uh, last episode, we had a little controversy. I love controversy, but um, I happened to mention last episode about a reprint of The Brain of Morbius in 1978. Uh, the, immediately after the episode aired, I got pelted with, where's your proof? I've never heard of this before. I've been collecting for years. Never saw this book. Mm. Well, the, the book was mentioned in the Chris Stone unofficial guide. So it, it was mentioned there. Of course, they did try They did. Basically, they tracked down and found Christopher Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know about this? And so he's like, um, I don't have one personally, but this is what I was told from da da da. So they, they're trait. They're actually. It's like it's almost like they're they're going after the 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 sources, not to hurt anybody, but they want to find proof because they all want this book. <laughs> so, so right now the call the proof of life on this one is it's called into question. So if if any of my listeners out there happen to have a copy of the Brain of Morbius, I don't even have one myself. Uh, a first edition is is hard to find, but if you have one that is a second edition that could quell this mob uh and and they're all friends of mine so they're a friendly mob uh but uh <laughs> let's send me a proof of life of that one so that we can we can say but right now i'm, I'm going to stand by my reporting until such time that i can be absolutely sure that it doesn't exist because for a long time i didn't think the loch ness monster third printing exists mm-hmm. but it does it's on my shelf so <laughs> And and I got one just recent. I got it just recently. So the new source I'm using has some information. None of it has been independently verified. So that's my disclaimer. So there we go. Uh, so we're going to start in January, uh, January 1979. We start with a brand new book, Doctor Who and the Hand of Fear by Terence Dix, with a cover by Ray Knipe or Knipe. And I do not have it in card cover, but here is the. Target book here, if I can get out the light on there. It's it's a beautiful cover, and uh, one of the things about the cover is that um, he had a picture of Tom Baker from the story, but Sarah Jane was from a different story, so that's why the outfit doesn't match the one from Hand of Fear, necessarily. So he didn't have that information when they drew the book, because they wanted to um, publish this book at the same time um, that the story aired, or very close to it. And it didn't happen. So this came out in early 1979. Um, his, the original painting of this cover sold at auction for 500 pounds in July of 2002. And uh, the book is very hard to find, considering I don't have one. Not in my collection at this present time. Uh, I'm guessing about 300 to 400 dollars if you can find one in X library condition. Possibly more if you find one in nine library condition. So the Target Book Club did review this book. So Tony, what was the verdict on the story? Um, that was in episode 90 of the podcast, which, by the way, you can find on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Doctor Who Target BC, and. We had a four-person panel that time. In addition to Allison, myself, and Dalton, we had Jennifer Picker on. Oh, very nice. My good friend Jennifer. Jennifer just uh, joined us recently for our discussion of the Leisure Hive. Right. Yes, that's right. She mentioned that to me. And, uh, of course, I just got done listening to the Androids of Tara, the David Fisher um, version. And, of course, you know, being being a collector and I get a lot of things in and I don't always remember what comes in, I forgot I had a copy of that Target book in my collection <laughs> because I order things directly from England. I don't wait for the American audiences to get it because they uh, I mean, Amazon is terrible in the United States as yes. far as I'm concerned because they're always canceling Doctor Who deliveries. So I go to Amazon UK. And by the way, listeners, if you go to amazon.co.uk, your existing login will work for that site and any Amazon site. You know, just set up your payment information the same. They'll convert the currency and they'll get it to you a lot faster and in really good shape. In fact, I got it in one day after it was released. DHL was on my door and it didn't cost any extra. Wow. So it's such a good deal. In fact, I just found out today that the Doctor Who Annual 2022 uh, was just shipped. 
So that will not be available in the, in the American stores for another month. So it's it's on its way. So I would say, you know, you pay you don't pay very much more. The conversion rate's pretty good. But yeah, I do have a copy of that book. I haven't read it yet, but uh definitely tune into the podcast. It's a definite um uh difference between the Fisher book and the Terrence Dix novelization. So right. um, you know, I'm not, you know, also also an avid fan of the podcast. So if you're so, ever gonna read one of the Fisher reissues, do the Stones of Blood. Because uh, yes, yes. Androids of Tara yes. is still not great. But anyway, our ratings on Hand of Fear. <laughs> Hand of Fear, yes. Yeah. Um, Allison surprised us all by giving it a two. Wow. <laughs> That's, That's heavy, heavy sarcasm, <laughs> actually. But uh, Jennifer gave it a four because it's one of her favorite stories. Dalton okay. gave it a 2.5. And I gave it a three because I actually found it was one of the stronger Terrence Dix books. That mm. story itself is fairly weak on screen, mm. and that's done deliberately because Liz Sladen didn't want grand fanfare for her last story. Right. So it suffers as a result. Also, Bob Baker and Dave Martin's stories suffer as a result, but it's one of those few rare times that Terrence Dix is looking at a Bob Baker and Dave Martin script and saying, okay, this is a companion's last story. Let's do it properly. Yeah, and Eldrad must live. Indeed. <laughs> Oh, well, they worked so hard putting out the hand of fear that they thought, well, why why are we going to break our backs? Let's do a reprint. Mm -hmm. So they did a reprint of Doctor Who and the Space War. And this is the actual second edition reprint with the blank back. The first edition has the coming soon titles on the back there. This also does have the uh, picture of Malcolm Hulk on the inside. And this happens to be an ex-library copy. But it's, uh, it's not bad. Of course, this is one of the final times you'll see the beautiful artwork of Chris Achilleos, the late Chris Achilleos, um, and doing the Ogron and all that. It's just a beautiful picture. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, of course, the what I thought originally, and I've mentioned this before, that this was the last reprint. Turns out I was wrong. Mm. Uh, W.H. Allen does one additional reprint in 1985. So we'll have to wait till we get there because the Target Book Club needs a little time to catch up on those stories. So it'll be a while before we reveal that one. But this is the last book to bear the longbow um, marking on the side. This says W.H. Allen Longbow. The first edition will say Allen Wingate on the side or Wingate. And so that's one way you can tell right off the bat. Uh, I also have a first edition of this in my collection, but uh, this one I bought in 1985 at a convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There was a dealer there that had this, and the book was $20. Hmm. So I said, I'll take it, 20 bucks. I got that. Um, so the first edition, of course, had 3,000 copies printed. The reprint had a 1,500 print run, according to this new source. Um, and this book was put out for two pound. 95, which today would be 14 pound 23, which translates to $16 and 72 cents. So in 1979, that's a lot of money because uh, if, you know, we didn't mention this before uh, with the 79, but in 79, we had terrible inflation. Gas prices were high. Well, that's happening today too, but <laughs> you know, where Jimmy Carter was president, that's the only thing that's not happening today. But uh, it was it was just one of those. Uh, the the economy was was not good. I remember my father getting angry because he waited in line for gas for for a while. But sixteen dollars for a hardcover was probably out of the reach for many people. So that was the only two things that happened uh, in. Um, in January. And of course, they were so exhausted doing that reprint, which all they had to do was a couple of minor changes on the jacket, is that they didn't put out any books in February. <laughs> so we have to go to March. So in March, we have Doctor Who and the Invisible Enemy uh, the, by Terrence Dix, the cover by Roy Knipe. And uh, I do not have a copy of the hardcover, but this is the uh, paperback, and it's a wonderful picture of Tom Baker on the front cover. Uh, 3,500 copies of the hardcover were printed, uh, and the book comes out at the exact same time as the paperback. Now, I know in uh, when I worked in publishing, the idea was you always put the hardcover out first, and then after that sold out, then later you put out the paperback to kind of, but this wasn't how 
Wyndham operated with Doctor Who, uh, sometimes the hardcover would come out and then this would come out three months later. Mm-hmm. Or this, or the paperback would come out and you'd never see the hardcover. So it's, it's one of those things. Um, the book... Um, page turn. The story features, of course, the first appearance of K-9. Uh, and sadly, the book is very hard to find in hardcover, very difficult to put a price on it since I have never seen a copy uh, so I'm going to say $500 on up, depending on condition. This book, of course, has a price increase to £3.25, which is roughly £15 today, or $17.62. So there was a little price increase over that month. Uh, so the car- Target copy has the same cover as the hardback without the, the Target logo. Uh, anyway, the Target Book Club did review this one. So, Tony, what was the uh, verdict on that one? Well, when we did this in episode 97, none of us would have paid $500 for a copy of this book. In fact, we would have been hard-pressed to pay five. Uh, um, I wouldn't either. Yeah, Dalton <laughs> gave it a 2.5, Allison gave it a 2.5, and I gave it a 2. And you may notice something that Dalton and Allison gave it the same score, which is really unusual. Yeah, it, that is unusual. Dalton didn't like it, Allison thought it was okay, and I didn't care for for it simply because it's, again, not terribly great. It's another Bob Baker and Dave Martin, but this <laughs> time Terrence Dix is looking at it and saying, eh, pass. He's not very happy with it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that's a shame because I, I actually did like the TV story because I enjoyed K-9, but of course, you, you, as I look at it as an adult, the um, the the costume of the virus yes. <laughs> is is pretty bad. And I, and I, um, by the way, not to, not to, to plug another podcast that's completely in a different network. If you, if you've ever watched, uh, I Claudius, mm-hmm. you have to listen to John Hodgman's I Podius. Oh, wow. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> he actually just, you don't even need to watch I Claudius. Just listen to the, to the, um, to the podcast because he goes through each episode of I Claudius. But what's interesting is John Hodgman is a big Doctor Who fan. Mm -hmm. So, so he refers to actors in the series who actually do the trifecta. (laughs) They're in Doctor Who, Blake seven and some other show. Uh, And, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, he was in Blake seven, you know, and they, they always bring that up in the, and, and of course they talk about the sets being slightly downgraded from Dr. Who. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it was filmed in somebody's basement. <laughs> They're not wrong, unfortunately. <laughs> no, but uh, definitely uh, check it out. That's of course on the maximum fun network, but um, that's, that's real interesting about that. Um, next, of course, you know, I don't know, how hard they work at doing these books at Wyndham Publishing, but they took all of April off as well. <laughs> what a great job. One book in March. All right. We'll see you in May. And of course, we go to May of 1979 and they thought, let's really phone it in because the next book to come out is Doctor Who Jr. and the Giant Robot. <laughs> So this is, of course, the Doctor and Giant uh, Junior and the Giant Robot by Terrence Dix. This is the first Doctor Who hardcover to not have a removable dust jacket, and the reason for that is this was marketed as a children's book, and a children's book that would cost more than twenty dollars to buy. So I'm not sure, but uh, why that was. But this book was supposedly aimed at five to eight year olds, and the other part that was a head scratcher was. This would have been perfect for the longbow imprint, mm-hmm. but it doesn't. It just says WH Allen on the side. So I thought, hmm, that is not the... Uh, and, of course, I don't have the the title page on this copy is ripped out. Um, this is an ex-library copy from what I can tell. There are no markings, but I think uh, whoever sold this book before I got it decided to take all evidence of that away. But um, that's okay. The title page would have helped with, you know, that. But um, the <laughs> the artwork here is um, not as good as the uh, as the target line. Uh, Harry Hans did the uh, cover art. No publication numbers are available for this title uh, from any source. This book is very difficult to find, and you will find it for four hundred or five hundred dollars on eBay. Um, we have a possible uh, theory that the books didn't do very well and that they dumped them. 
because I do remember uh, in 85 when we were ordering hardbacks from Lyle Stewart, we inquired because we had seen ads for these books and uh, we were told they were completely unavailable. So that was the thing. Uh, So the source uh, also says that this book did not come out in April or May of 1979. This says that it was delayed until December. So I've got three conflicting publication dates. So I'm throwing it in in the first date because that makes sense uh, as far as when they were planning things. Uh, I guess Graham Williams did not like the picture of Tom Baker on the front cover. And is what was <laughs> and exactly, and so and of course he didn't like the illustrations either, which were by Peter Edwards. Let me see if I can get an illustration up there. So the illustrations were not as good as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so not for him around. So this is going to be a very interesting um, review because I was on the podcast for this one. Yes, <laughs> and I am embarrassed. I have to admit I have made a serious blunder. Okay. Episode 107, which you were on and Trey Corte was on. Yes. We reviewed both this book and Morbius. And the Brain of Morbius, yes. Today, in pulling the reviews and the numbers, I somehow pulled the Morbius numbers. I, oh. I did not pull the giant robot numbers. <laughs> From my memory, I believe they were similar. Yep, I think so. <laughs> So I think we're going to be okay. (laughs) I think we're going to be okay because I seem to remember giving Giant Robot, um, I I think I gave Giant Robot somewhere around a two, and what you gave to Morbius was a two. So that sounds about right. I seem to recall that both of those books you were kind of... hmm, no, and I, I think Trey gave one a zero. He gave both of them a zero. A zero, yeah, and that it and there, there was it was very unusual. We couldn't uh, just to recap, and I would definitely you know my listeners go back and listen to that one because that was a very interesting discussion we had because there were so many different theories about these books, whether Terrence Dix himself tried to make more money and propose them, or he he was told to write them and he did it kind of lackluster and. I don't think my fi- a five year old kid could read this book. No, and so or, or even understand it. And there's violence, and there's thing there's things in here that I certainly you know if I was a parent I'd be like ah no you're not reading this. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> and so and the junior editions, uh, even the paperback versions of the junior editions are very difficult to find. So we were trying to figure out why did they disappear? If did they do a three thousand print run on this and decided to bail? We don't know. And there's no evidence to suggest uh, that it didn't happen. So, you know, maybe uh, one of my friends out there in the who listened to this podcast knows more about this. I would love to hear the story if you know anything about it. Mm-hmm. So, um, of course, that was, uh, you know, that was a, just a, a, a slow month. So it, it took two months to produce that. That's <laughs> what was crazy. But also they have a redeeming factor in May here, or maybe not, depending. But they came out with Doctor Who and the Robots of Death by Terrence Dix. Uh, this book is back to having a removable dust jacket. There's a wonderful picture of uh, Terrence Dix in there. And this happens to be a non-library copy that I've had for a number of years. It was not part of U.S. distribution, but a dealer had this one at a convention I worked. And it's uh, it's got an orange spine and back, which is really interesting. It kind of sets itself apart. And there's a couple of copies this year where they do change the color of the, the usual white backing there um and they hadn't done it since the first edition of Loch Ness Monster which has a dark blue spine with white lettering it's really really nice very difficult to find that as well uh, according to this John Geary did the uh, cover art for this and about 3500 copies were probably released this book is very hard to find i have not seen any other copies i've had this copy for close to 20 years uh, no stamps in it, so I'm declaring it a non-library copy. Uh, if you would like to, by the way, listeners, if you want to see a video of the podcast, if you're listening going, I can't see anything, it's not a video, uh, you can go to our Patreon page and start at the $15 level to see all of our podcast videos, including this one and all the other episodes that we film here on Zoom. Uh, so I put a value probably about $500 or more, uh, especially in this condition, a non-library copy, maybe 250 or more, depending, but I haven't seen one, so that price could vary, and I've seen a lot 
lot of books come out on eBay. Uh, some rarer stuff like Time Warrior came out at a really high price because that hadn't been seen in a while and people were starting to move the prices up. So I'm curious to know, what was the uh, Target Book verdict on this one? Well, episode 94, we covered this one. And by the way, I forgot to mention when we yes. were talking about um, the a book of uh, Invisible Enemy. Oh, yeah, and yeah. why we didn't, we didn't like it very much. But that was kind of an outlier because this was during a stretch where we had a lot of Karen Sticks books all in a row. Yes. But he was also on fire during that yeah. particular era. And Robots of Death has some of our highest scores ever. Allison yeah. gave it a three, which is really unusual. Dalton gave it a 3.75. And I gave it a 3.5. And the reason why those scores are unusual is because what your listeners and viewers may not know is that Robots of Death is one of the shortest target novelizations. Hmm. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see the page count in the hardcover here. 108 pages. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly so. short. This is during a time when Taron Stix is trying very hard to stick to that 127-page uh, uh, ballpark, and this one doesn't do it. And my only oh. thought about that is that given that that story is mostly close-ups of robots' feet walking mm, yes. while a heartbeat <laughs> is playing on the synthesizer. That's probably something you can't really put in a book. <laughs> so that's why it's so short. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I didn't mind the, uh, the, the TV version. I actually wasn't, uh, you know, the robots were actually not too terrible. Oh, it's a great um, story. It's, and it's a great story. Uh, lots of, uh, and of course there's been lots of follow up on big finish, uh, you know, and so there's a lot of stories based on these robots and including one of the I can't think of the actor's name, but the guy that pl uh, plays one of the uh, members of the Sand Miner actually becomes the Celestial toy maker in the Nightmare Fair. David from Bailey. Big Finish. Yes. And he does a great job with that. Um, I believe he's passed on. So that's, um, you know, so you won't see him as the toy maker. And there's a big rumor that uh, Neil Patrick Harris is the new toy maker. But we, we don't know. We won't know until the 60th airs. So but that's that's interesting to note that it is the shortest book because I just looked at Space War and it's 142 pages. Yes. So it's uh, definitely definitely a short book. And of course, did they change the price based on that? Nope. Three pound, <laughs> three pound 50 for this one back then. Um, this book, oh gosh, it's, it's just uh, definitely it's definitely been well read, but the dust jacket is in really nice condition. So, of course, that must that short book took a lot of effort because um, they took another month off. So, <laughs> so um, we go to October. <laughs> October. Oh, we, we jump well past, you know, we're in July. We just did July and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, oh, excuse me. No, no, I'm reading too far in my script. Now we go to July. So now we're at the uh, we're at the Disco Rias uh. and we get Doctor Who and the Image of the Fendall by Terrence Dix with cover by John Geary. And here is that beautiful hardcover edition back to the white spine. And um Let's see, pick the same. They use the same picture, Terrence Dix, throughout the entire uh, run. This was actually withdrawn from the Cambridgeshire Library, but it's in really nice shape. The only marking is a, is a withdrawn stamp right on the inside cover. Uh, these books, actually, I, when I got this one, it had one of those uh, clear plastic protectors on the dust jacket, and it kept the dust jacket in mint condition. Just Amazing what libraries can do. Um, this copy probably had about 3,500 copies initially pr printed at that time. Not very hard to find. I've seen many copies over the years. Um, this copy is just a, with one stamp on it. And it's pretty much in mint after that. So I would say uh, you've been looking at $300. I've seen it for $280. i have seen it for $320. So somewhere in that $300 range could get you a copy that's pretty decent. 
Um, so, Tony, what was the verdict on Image of the Fendal? That was another one that we were impressed by. Alice mm-hmm. gave it a 2.75, which is actually quite high for her again. Yes. Dalton gave it a 3.25, which is high even for him. And I gave it a 3 because there's just something about that book. Terrence Dix must have mm-hmm. really loved Chris Boucher's scripts. Because not only did he do his damnedest on Robots of Death, he turns in a version of Image of the Fendall that's marvelous and even brings uh, Grandma Tyler to Mm. life in the same way as she is on screen, which is just remarkable. Oh, that's great. And I just noticed that it's only two pages longer than Robots of Death. Yeah. 109 pages. Yeah. So interesting that he got, you know, he's doing some of his best work in shorter um, in shorter book um, length here. That's yeah. really interesting. Oh, gosh. And that's one of my favorite TV stories as well. Just uh, it, that I was really, uh, I, I know, I don't, I'm not sure I shared this story on the podcast, but of course, in, in 1978, uh, I do remember seeing Doctor Who on the TV guide, so I turned it in, and it was Tom Baker, and at first I was like, wait, that's not the right guy, so I turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> and so about, I think it was about a month later, I saw it again, and I said, I'll turn it on again. So I turned it on, and I happened to catch, and I swear to God this happened, the first episode of Robot. Ah. So I saw what happened, and I went, ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then I was like, all right. I, I just accepted it and moved on. So it, it's, uh, I've never missed an episode after that. So they were, we got, you know, between 78 and 83, 84, we got like 18 runs of the Tom Baker era. So um, I know almost every story better than I know anything from the new era because I've only seen it once. So really, really interesting. I have one other point to make about Image of the Fendal, and it's interesting that this happened last night. I Uh I've been on and I've been on this kick lately as I've been falling asleep of watching old obscure anime series on YouTube. Uh-huh. And I found one called Dream Hunter Rem, which is about a magical girl who goes into people's dreams and takes care of nightmares or whatever. And at one point in episode two of this anime, this Japanese anime from 1986, you see one of the monsters in the background is a Fendaline. Mm. And I had to go back and look at it again, and I said, no, that's actually a Fendaline. Someone, there's wow. some... Japanese Doctor Who fan in 1986 working on this anime, and they put it in the anime briefly, but it's there. That is cool. I mean, uh, there's, um, I know that there are um, YouTube videos out there where they show little Doctor Who Easter eggs in other shows, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but that's really interesting that you found that. I, I, I'm always looking for things like that. It's just really cool that that happened Mm -hmm. um and of course now we uh we we leave july and now we go to october so (laughs) down august september we're done there so the next book in 19 in october 1979 we have doctor who and the war games by malcolm hulk with the original script by terrence dix and malcolm hulk cover art by john geary uh noting to my viewers out there just looking at this cover the absence of the second doctor image, mm-hmm. which is done on purpose. Uh, the editors decided we're not going to confuse our audience because right now Tom Baker is the doctor. And so they did not include pictures of previous doctors uh, on books that were published during the 70s. And not, as you notice, most of the books we've done so far were, you know, there was one John Pertwee reprint and his picture is not on the cover which is probably why they chose it for reprint. Uh, And all the other ones were Tom Baker stories. So we have our first Patrick Troughton story and the final Patrick Troughton story without a picture of Patrick Troughton. But if you go back to the 70s, you've got the Abominable Snowman with a picture of Patrick on there, but the reprint doesn't. So there's uh, this Doctor Who and the Cybermen have a picture of Patrick on the cover. The reprint doesn't. So just pointing that out. Um... Malcolm Hulk died shortly after completing this book. Um, this, will, this would be his final, his final one. Uh, there are some variants on the dust jacket. I do not have this particular variant, but I was asked about this. Uh, the reason that there is no photograph 
uh, on the inside back here is that later editions, the first few hundred that were printed, had Malcolm Hulk's bio with Terrence Dick's photo. <laughs> so they decided instead of trying to redo it, because this is 1979, they don't have Adobe products back then. So they said, we'll just take the photo out. So the later copies, and I have two copies of this book, and both copies have this inner jacket, but I have seen photographs of the actual jacket if you got one of the first 300 copies, and that puts a significant value on those copies of the book. Uh, this particular hardcover has sold for a lot of money. Uh, the variant edition, uh, David J. Howe, as a matter of fact, sold a copy of this uh, for close to $1,000. And uh, these books now are going for as high as seven or eight hundred dollars. So I guess they're very difficult to find. Um, the I you know that's it's just amazing to me. I've had this one for quite some time. the uh, The book had a price increase to three pounds seventy five, and it features a yellow logo, but a beautiful blue spine. I love that. That just really stands out with the blue backing on that. Um, my personal memory, of course, uh, back in uh, 1982, I joined a Doctor Who fan club in Skokie called the Emissaries of the White Guardian. And it was run by a guy named Gordon Lurie. And I remember when I mentioned that name at Chicago TARDIS, John Lavallee said, oh, Gordon Lurie. I was hoping somebody would talk about him. Well, he's the guy that actually started the process of pirating Doctor Who in, the, in this country. He would get the tapes from England. He would set up a PAL VCR and a PAL TV uh, with a converter, and then he would put a very powerful uh, video camera, the best you could get in 1982, and would put it in front of the TV, and you would get those flickering copies. Maybe you've seen one, Tony? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So apparently that's ground. That's patient zero for those tapes. And I remember... Uh, Eventually, as I went to enough meetings, you got invited into the inner sanctum and saw this setup, and I was just blown away. But uh, my memory of seeing a little bit of the war games, uh, he, we had a meeting where we had episode 10 of the war games, and then he followed that up with Spearhead from Space, which was kind of a cool way to watch it. But the copy of War Games 10 was so terrible. Um, it had audio problems, it was flickering real bad, and it the film was not right, and I'm not sure where it came from. It, it probably was filmed off of a screen in England before being sent over to the United States. And he didn't have the whole thing. He just had episode 10. We knew the whole thing existed at that point, but he only had part 10. And so that was a really interesting um, way to see it. And, of course, seeing it with a very clear copy of Spearhead from Space that he had gotten. It was still flickering, but it was better. Um, so again, I would say expect to pay a thousand dollars or more. Um, and, uh, if you find the Terrence Dix error photo, I would say more than that. Um, what was the, uh, review on this one? It's been a while for this one. I know. Yes. We go back to episode 49 for this one. We had JG McQuarrie on oh, yes, for that yes. particular one. Uh, who did a podcast called talking who to you, which now is sadly yes. defunct. But he's now doing a Star Trek podcast, which will be interesting. He gave it the unusual score of 2.971. And that's pretty specific. He said he had worked <laughs> it out very carefully. Uh, and Dalton gave it a 3.5. Allison gave it a 3. And I gave hmm. it a 4 because all of us were immensely impressed with this book, especially since, as you say... Uh, Malcolm Hulk had to have been working on it during the time that he was dying. Yes. And it is a distillation of 10 episodes into, I believe that one is actually a standard length novelization. It doesn't really go one, over the page count much. 100, 143 pages. Yep, yeah. So it's only slightly longer. And in fact, it's no longer than any other Malcolm Hulk novelization. So that tells you something. Malcolm Hulk was a genius when it came to economy of language. So that is something to marvel at. The, the book is well worth any amount of money mm -hmm. that you pay for it. 
I've read the book and I, it is one of the most impressive uh, novels I've ever read. And I read it a long time ago because I was curious uh, to know about what happened uh, before the exile. And the only way you could do that was Doctor Who and the War Games was available at the local shop. And I bought the paperback long before I had the, the hardcover, but uh, just a, just a really good read. And uh, the last chapter, of course, The Trial of Doctor Who is very well written. And, yeah, it's one of my favorite stories, both on screen and both um, in print. And, of course, if you want to watch the entirety of the War Games and you have your BritBox account, you can binge watch that entire thing. They've got it there. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, well, meanwhile, we, we kind of jump across the pond here to come back to the United States. And, you know, the success of the Pinnacle paperbacks prompted a different publisher, Nelson Pub Doubleday, to get the rights to three Doctor Who stories that they decided to do for a hardcover book club edition. And they called it The Adventures of Doctor Who. And this one was done of, by all Terrence Dick stories, and this includes uh, Genesis of the Daleks, uh, Terror of the Zygons, and uh, Revenge of the Cybermen. Of course, they call it the Loch Ness Monster in this particular book. Um, what's interesting, the cover is by John Lisko, by the way, and features the same introduction by Harlan Ellison that's in the paperback Pinnacle Editions. And you notice that the Doctor Who logo is very similar to the Pinnacle. Let me hold that up just for comparison there. Mm -hmm. Very similar. So for a long time, people called this the, the definitive Pinnacle hardback, <laughs> even though... It's not. <laughs> it's, it's by Nelson Doubleday. This was never sold in stores. Um, the only way you could get it was if you were part of the Nelson Doubleday book club, of which, of course, I joined <laughs> because they were offering this book. Now, I didn't get this book in 1979. I got this copy. This is a first printing. They printed a lot of them because I bought this in 1986 along with the follow-up book, The Further Adventures of Doctor Who. Uh, and Nelson Doubleday required you to buy six books at their price, whatever, plus $4 shipping. So I gave my mother the money, and she wrote a check, and I ordered three of these and three of the other one. <laughs> I didn't know if you could do that. You could. <laughs> they didn't say no. So I got a box uh, about six weeks later with three stacked of these on one side, three on the other, separated by tissue paper. It was really well packed. Um, I ended up selling the other four copies through bundles from Britain that same year. So we, we sold them. I think the, the cost per book at the book club was $6.95. Not too bad. Um, the nice thing, though, the other interesting part, though, is that they credit the first credit they give here is published by agreement with Pinnacle Books. And the work is copyrighted by Universal Tandem. So they actually got these are actually the, the, the Pinnacle novels inside this book. So they're all Americanized. You know, all your torches are flashlights, your boots are trunks, your, you know, your bonnet is your hood and all that great stuff. So the best things about Pinnacle. But this is also a hardcover with a removable dust jacket. And it has, I'm going to take this off here so you can see this beautiful gold bound cover here. It's a beautiful book. They printed probably, I would say, 30,000 of these. Very easy to find. Uh, we're not going to rate this one because, for one thing, they're reprints and they're Pinnacles. So, you know, they don't follow, they don't follow under the, uh, the strict standards of the Target Book Club. <laughs> <laughs> Though I do have a story about it. Oh, well, we'll get, we'll, we'll, yeah, hold, hold that thought for one second. Sure. Let me just finish my thought here on this. Um, you can find these books for as low as $20 in mint condition. Don't pay anything more because there's a lot of them out there. People got wise to these. They bought them through the book clubs. They've been distributed all over the country. Very rare in the UK, though as well as Pinnacle Books, they're going to pay a little bit more to import these over there. So if you have these and you want to make friends with somebody in the UK, you can make their day because they do not have these in their Doctor Who collection. Uh, Tony, you said you had a story about this. I do. This, this was also, those two books were also offered by the Science Fiction Book Club 
which yes. ran under the same sort of strictures. In fact, I got drummed out of the science fiction book club because I did not buy the amount of books that you were supposed to buy in the given year, simply because they had the best offer. It was the initial offer was something like eight books for the price of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was That's... astounding. So what I would go what I would do is I would go through and choose the most expensive of the hardback books and get the eight and then not pay anything else. And the two Doctor Who books weren't available at that time when I was still a member, but I saw them later and thought, okay, I've burned my bridge with this book club. There's no way I can get these now, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting how how they they did that. And, uh, of course, Nelson Doubleday uh, got the rights and other um, science fiction book club, I remember that as well. And people were talking about these books. But I, I just remember I had the extra ones, so we, we did bring them to one convention and we sold them out very quickly. And I don't remember what we sold them for, but they were just something on the table and something like, Hey, I've never seen that. I'll take that. You know, and that was kind of an interesting way to, to, to publish those books. And so this actually falls into that 1979 category. It's not a WH Allen book, but it's also collectible. Uh, so then we do go to November and we get uh, only two books left, folks. So here we go. November, Doctor Who and the Destiny of the Daleks by Terrence Dix and a cover by Andrew Skilleter. Mm-hmm. So it's a wonderful cover. Uh, 4,000 copies were printed. Um, and one thing to note, the ISBN number on the inside jacket is incorrect. <laughs> it is correct in the book, but not correct on the jacket. Uh, oops. Uh, this is the first novel that Andrew Skilleter got to illustrate. Uh, after he did the Dalek special, they hired him to do K-9 and other mechanical creatures, and he got this one. So you can get the uh, print of this cover from Andrew Skilleter's website. You can find it at andrewskilleter.com. Um, I've, uh, I will actually, uh, in a couple of, uh, episodes, I'll be talking with Andrew Skilleter because Exterminart is coming out his book, um, and the gold edition and the standard edition. Uh, if you bought the gold edition, which was about, I think $200, you got a personalized drawing inside the book of any cover you wanted. Mm. So for me, uh, my copy has, has a hand-drawn day of the Daleks cover. Mm. So that will be fun to see when that comes in. And he wants to talk about it, and he's uh, agreed to be on the podcast. So uh, just a, a wonderful uh, pioneer in the uh, in the Doctor Who covers. He was a good friend of Chris Achilleos as well. Um, and you will see a lot more Andrew Skilleter on the covers for the remaining run of the Doctor Who books. So here's an interesting thing about this. The cover uh, of Tom Baker here is actually taken from a picture of the pirate planet. And this book was done while the story was actually still filming. Oh, wow. So Terrence Dix was only working from rehearsal scripts. So I'd be curious to see what your rating was in this, because it sounds like you didn't know that. (laughs) I didn't, actually. So this will be interesting. But, yeah, they, they wanted this book, and it did. It came out when episode four aired, this book hit the shelf. Mm. So it was the first time they were able to do that, but it was very frustrating, according to um, some things that were talked about with Terrence Dix, about only getting a little bit of the scripts at a time because they were also giving them to the actors. (laughs) And so that was what we were working from. And um, Andrew Skilleter said he was put on a rush to do this. It was kind of his test, and he passed it with flying colors. But now that we have that information out there, what did the Target book think of this book? Well, when we covered it in episode 111, we knew that it came out really soon after the story was released and we thought we did think that was odd we didn't know he was working for the rehearsal scripts Mm. that will explain why it's so good (laughs) because uh dalton gave it a three allison wasn't too keen on it she was back to her usual thinking eh, it was fine is a direct quote from this one she gave it a 1.5 Okay, And I gave it a three and almost went higher because, as I recall, for some reason, this one is so much better on the page than it is on screen. Yeah, the screen version was a 
big disappointment, especially for a Dalek story, and only the second Dalek story that Tom will ever do. Um, and I remember when I watched it, I got really excited. Then I was like, is that it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was very, very, um, I don't know, the Daleks weren't very good. They had to get a different guy to do Davros. Um, they introduced the Movellans, which was kind of cool because they get brought back later. Um, but yeah, no, and of course they tie this story directly to Revelation of the Daleks in the Peter Davison era because the spaceship that Davros is frozen on gets hijacked in space much later. Um, but yeah, this was uh, definitely uh, one of my favorite books to read. And I got this information from that new source that said he was working from rehearsal scripts. Hmm. So I don't doubt it because it makes sense to me. Uh, I wanted to also point out that this book has a beautiful red spine and back, kind of changing it up a little bit. Uh, it does include, of course, the same photo of Terrence Dix that they use in every other book. <laughs> not sure, not sure why. Uh, it's a little, oh, that's stuck there. So I'm going to leave that right the way it, right the way it is. This is an ex-library copy. Uh, this is actually very hard to find. I've seen three copies in the last 25 years. Cool. So I would say $400 or more, depending on the uh, condition. Um, this is the last copy of uh, this is the last hardcover that I own for 1979, but not the last book. Um, you'll notice even I do not have a full run of hardbacks from any given year because of how rare they are and how expensive they're getting. Uh, so um, that's just a, it's just so crazy how this works. But we have one final book in 1979. And we get this, uh, I've got the target, the target book here. It's Doctor Who and the Ribos Operation by Ian Martyr with the cover by John Geary. Uh, the cover was actually drawn before Destiny of the Daleks, and they kind of delayed this one to come out a little bit later. Uh, the Key to Time series had already run because uh, Destiny of the Daleks is the first one. Uh, I believe it's the first one in that next season. So they, they go to that. Uh, about 3,000 copies were printed. Um, and possibly Doctor Who Jr. and the Giant Robot may have come out in December, according to one source, so we'll just do that. This is the first of only five of the Key to Time books, because the Pirate Planet would not ever be published by W.H. Allen, and it would be many years before it will be. So uh, just to, to pause on that for a moment, I'm going to hold up this one. This came out in 2017. The uh, Douglas Adams Pirate Planet. I think uh, a lot had to do with the Douglas Adams uh, uh, story. And I believe, uh, let's see, Douglas Adams died in 1982, I want to say. Oh, 92. Huh? 92. 92, excuse me. I knew there was a two in there, but 92. Um, so I, you know, they, they talked about WH Allen not having the rights to Pirate Planet or Shada at that time. Uh, so. The uh, this book, by the way, uh, was retail at sixteen ninety nine, so it was actually cheaper than a W H Allen book back in nineteen seventy nine. But printing has come uh, a long way since then. Anyway, I have not seen any copies of the Ribos Operation for sale in the last twenty five years, so I would guess that it would have an average price of five hundred or more, depending on condition. Uh, I do not have a copy. So uh, I do remember the Key to Time series being one of my favorite sets of uh, Target Book Club episodes. So what was the uh, rating on Ribos? Well, here's the thing. (laughs) When we did uh, this for episode 103, we're big fans of Ian Martyr on the podcast. Oh, yeah. We adore Ian Martyr. But the problem is Ian Martyr did uh, roughly nine books, and you can split them into excellent Ian Martyr Good Ian Martyr and mediocre Ian Martyr. Ribos Operation fits into the mediocre category. Oh, Allison okay. gave it a 1.5, but then Allison always does. Uh, Dalton gave it a 3, despite his statement that it was bloated and too much. Hmm. And I gave it a 2.5 because I said, just like chocolate, even when it's at its worst, it's still Ian Martyr. Yeah. So he makes a lot of changes, and unfortunately, he's making those changes to a Robert Holmes script. 
If right, Terrence right. Dix had gotten hold of this, we'd probably think of it as one of the best novelizations ever. Hmm. As it is, it's instead seen as something of a misfire from Ian Martyr, and unfortunately not the only one, but definitely one of them. That's interesting. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's interesting for that because the, the hardcover edition of Ribos, I've never even seen one. Mm. And what's interesting there is that in a couple of years, when my company starts buying hardcovers, we have the other titles. We have Androids of Tara, we have Stones of Blood, we have Armageddon Factor, The Power of Kroll, all in hardcover in that batch because those were put out later um, than this. But this one did not get into that batch. So they either sold out pretty quickly or it, uh, you know, I have no idea what the circumstances were, but I have not seen any copies. This particular target is the seventh printing uh, that I got from Alien Entertainment not long ago because I realized I didn't have one of these in my box. Uh, I've got four boxes of Target books. I went through, I don't have Ribos operation. How is that possible? <laughs> People are going to get fired for this. I'm like, but uh, luckily Gene Smith had one of these on his shelf and I, I worked just down the street from the shop. So I you know popped in and it was uh, five bucks. So <laughs> not bad, not bad. It's a, it's a, it's actually probably looks like, in fact, this looks like a copy we probably had back then because it's got the Lyle Stewart um, address on the back. And so that's, that basically takes care of 1979. So um, if you want to own a, own a set of the 1979 hardbacks, good luck because I don't own a complete set. I don't know very many other people that do either. There's a handful of people that might, um, I, it's it may not be possible to own a set of 1979 books, but I did an estimated cost based on my guesses and what I've seen in the retail market and where the market's going. So you might expect to pay about three thousand five hundred thirty dollars for a full set. If you want to get a copy of the War Games with the error in it, add a thousand dollars to that. Ooh. So forty five thirty. Um, I don't see a lot of these come up for sale. Uh, every day I get an alert on various sites that a few W.H. Allen books are for sale, but not from this time. Usually it's anything after 1985, and we get those in there. So, of course, my, my advice to all collectors out there, make sure, you know, have uh, be patient, negotiate, um, you know, prefer auction style versus buy it now because you have some power there. Put if you're an eBay person, put it on your watch list. There's a good chance the seller will offer you a break because they want to move it. Um, and so that's a that's a good way to do it. You can also find titles at abooks.com. That's a conglomerate of used bookstores across the world, uh, and you might be able to find a good price there. Uh, be aware of price gouging. Be careful of books that are priced too high. Um, watch the Facebook groups like the Target Book uh, Facebook group. And there are some great respected sellers out there. And I recommend people like Dale Santos and David Russell. Uh, Dale is from California and David is from Scotland. So, uh, of course, David usually has a better handle on things because a lot of those books show up in his local bookshops. My special thanks to my guest, Tony Witt. Uh, thank you so much for being here and giving us your um, amazing information here about what the novel contains versus what the collectability is. And tell our listeners again where they can find the Doctor Who Target Book Club. You can find it on SoundCloud.com at SoundCloud.com forward slash DWTargetBC. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at DWTargetBC or subscribe to us via the podcast provider of your choice, excluding Spotify. And yes, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. And if all else fails, which will inevitably do, will. You, you, can, <laughs> you can email him directly at Emperor Dalek. Uh, oh, go ahead and give the email. I don't always remember it. It's Emperor Dalek at gmail.com. At Very gmail.com. Easy to remember. That's, what I, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, of course, our future episodes, our next uh, installment of this will probably be a few months down the line here, but we will be covering the classic hardcovers of 1980, which, to give you a little teaser on that, will be the last year for removable dust jackets and they do it mid year. Mm. So when you get to June, it's like, we're done with the dust jackets. <laughs> oh, cheap bastards. <laughs> so, but on the plus side, you get one book 
that has a different cover art than the Target paperback. So that will be exciting. Also, you'll have the very first books that get distribution in the United States. The first books that I saw in 1985 when I unpacked several cartons that were sitting on Gene Smith's basement floor. um, And we found, you know, all these books that uh, that. Lyle Stewart basically wanted to get rid of. (laughs) And they were distributed, but not until 1985. So uh, you can follow us, of course, on Instagram at Doctor Who Collectors to see the full cover art of all the um, hardcover books. They po- they were posting those uh, periodically with little stories. We've had some great uh, feedback from even folks like, for instance, Andrew Skilleter um, noted that when I posted Doctor Who and the Crusaders, that um, that has gotten the hardback treatment every 10 years. Hmm. The first one came out in 1965 under the Muller, uh, the next one in 1975 under White Lion, and then 1985 with W.H. Allen. And, of course, Andrew Skilleter did the cover for 1985, which is why he was like, I didn't know that. (laughs) (laughs) So every 10 years you get a Crusaders. Well, in 95 you don't get one, but they did do a reprint of the Muller version a few years ago. So that's always interesting when you have that. Uh, By the way, if you have any uh, uh, proof uh, photos you want to share of hardbacks that are in better condition than what I can show or proof of life of books that – purportedly exist but we don't have proof you can email those photos to doctor who collectors podcast at gmail.com and put hardcover photos in the subject line so it doesn't go to my spam folder um if you want to see the video of this podcast and other podcasts join us at patreon and again uh thank you tony for joining us it's always great to talk to you thank you for having me And stay tuned, everybody, for the most outrageous offer. Hello, fellow time travelers, and welcome to the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the only podcast to discuss, in story order, all the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and every two weeks or so, I'm joined by a two- to three-person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979. That would be me. We also get the views of intermediate, casual, and novice fans who either have never seen the show or who have never read these books until these podcasts, including... Dalton Hughes. And... Alison Fitzsafried. You can find us on iTunes, Stitchers, or wherever you find good podcasts, or even ones like ours. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast on the Direction Point Podcast Network. Keep collecting! You are invited on an adventure across all of time and space, in a completely random order. It's the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. Jump in the TARDIS with your hosts, Eric Goldbranson, Asad Heshki, and Matthew Kressel. Explore Doctor Who TV stories, audio adventures, and books, both novels and non-fiction. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. It's the entire who universe On Shuffle. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a member of the Direction Point Network and is available about once a month wherever you find your podcasts. You are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. Keep collecting. There is no plot! I am being completely honest with you. And now it's time for the most popular segment at our program here, the most outrageous offers. I have three today that all come from the same location. So it's not a coincidence. I think this is one of those computerized uh, things where the price gets artificially inflated. However, the good news is if you need any of these items, you can get them at more reasonable prices. So uh, we'll start with the fact that we are looking from... Big Bill's Books in Austin, Texas. They've been an online seller only since 2020 with a five-star rating. So I'm not sure, you know, how this works here. Of course, as as a courtesy, we always reach out to these folks. And as of now, these listings are still there. The prices um, might fluctuate depending on uh, currency and all that stuff, so you never know. Uh, they're offering the first item here. Uh, they're offering a $3 shipping. And what we have here is Doctor Who, Daleks, The Mutation of Time, The Daleks Master Plan Part 2, a classic Doctor Who novel audiobook, uh, John Peel. And, of course, it's it's read by Peter Purvis and Gene Marsh. I do have this one in my collection. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and um, it says it's in very good condition. And they're asking for $6,336 even. That seems a bit high. 
Anyway, if you'd like a new copy, there are new copies available from $99 or a used opened copy from $47.89. So you still can get this at a reasonable price. Uh, the second item uh, is also from Big Bill's Books in Austin, Texas. And uh, this is uh, a book called Doctor Who Deadly Reunion by Terrence Dix. Uh, the book, uh, let's see here, 2003, published by Random House. It is in very good condition. It is a paperback and also shipping $3. Uh, the price they're asking is $5,934 even. So between the mutation of time and that, we're up to about eleven, dollars almost $12,000. Um, the good news here is you can get a, a slightly used copy for reading for $15, and uh, a mint copy for $52. So, and you might go to eBay and find it in between there. But I, I've looked this up. You can get this book for a lot less than $5,934. Seems a bit crazy. Okay. The last item here from the same bookstore, uh, Big Bill's Books in Austin, Texas, also has Doctor Who and Scratch Man. That's a recent publication by Tom Baker. Uh, 2019 by Penguin Group International. This is a very good condition book in hardcover, which is pretty common. You can find these pretty pretty, uh, pretty readily anywhere. Um, they're asking $5,511. So now we're up to almost $17,000, dollars $18, for three items. Um, I think this is, like I said, I think this is a, a, a computerized uh, bookstore. I don't think they even have the books in stock. Um, I haven't been able to find a physical location for Big Bill's book, so my guess is it's uh, somebody on there who's trying to pull a fast one. So I would say uh, don't buy it at that price. Uh, you can get a new copy of this book from Amazon for about $25. You can get some used copies for about $14 or less. And I believe the paperback is um, going to be, if it's not available, it should be. Uh, so if you really want a copy of this book, I have the audio book, which is wonderful. Uh, Tom Baker reads it. It's just amazing. It's a great story, too, by the way. Just a wonderful story. Um, but don't pay that kind of money for it. So, again, I thank my uh, listeners for sending those and drawing those links to my attention. If you find a, a, a Doctor Who item or Doctor Who related item that seems a bit too high for um, for uh, you know what we thought there, and um, I'll, I'm going to mention one more thing. We were watching an eBay sale of a copy of Doctor Who and the Crusaders. That's the White Lion 1975 uh, book or 76, uh, 75, 76 with Tom Baker on the cover. It was in pretty good condition and it sold for over 412 pounds, which is uh, almost $500. So it's, uh, I, I think that's uh, that's not an outrageous offer, but we do watch these uh, sales to say that those books are going for a little bit more money these days because they're very rare. I haven't seen very many White Lion books. I have a copy of the Zarbi in my collection, so um, it's very hard. The, Do the Doctor Who and the Daleks book by White Lion, almost impossible to find. So uh, one day we will do a, a, a show on those books specifically, and I'll see if I can locate some people that have those. Uh, anyway, uh, that uh, concludes Doctor Who collectors podcast for this uh, episode i want to especially thank my guest mr tony witt uh who joined us for the uh, hardcover review uh so lots of ideas on the on the plate for future episodes so just keep uh, us tabbed here we're on facebook twitter instagram and linkedin as well as our website at doctorwhocollectors.com um so watch out for future episodes there and of course we always want to talk to collectors if you want to share your collection story with us let us know at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast at gmail.com. For the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, I'm Larry Van Mersbergen, and keep collecting. Doctor Who Podcast Network.